The female reproductive system might seem complicated, but we can start by breaking it down into a few key areas. There are the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the uterus, the cervix, the vagina, and the vulva. In today's video, we'll focus on the internal reproductive organs only. Let's start at the ovaries. These are the paired female gonads and are similar structurally and functionally to the testes in the male. They are extremely important in producing and releasing the egg, or oocyte, and in acting as endocrine organs to produce oestrogen and progesterone. The ovaries are roughly the size of a golf ball in a young adult and lie either side of the uterus, just below the opening of the fallopian tubes, in a region referred to as the ovarian fossa, where the external iliac vein sits anteriorly and the internal iliac vein posteriorly. The ovaries are supported anteriorly by a flat fold of peritoneum known as the mesovarium. More on this later. The ovaries are held in their position by the suspensory ligaments of the ovary laterally and the proper ovarian ligament medially. The suspensory ligament extends from the mesovarium to the pelvic wall and not only acts to hold the ovary in place, but is also the conduit for all of the blood and nervous supply to the ovaries. This includes the ovarian artery, which comes from the abdominal aorta, the ovarian vein, which is formed from the pampiniform plexus and drains into the inferior vena cava on the right and renal vein on the left, the ovarian lymph vessels, which mostly drain into the paraaortic nodes, and the ovarian nervous plexus, which contains both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. The proper ovarian ligament is less complex and simply connects the ovary to the fundus of the uterus to hold it in place. If we cut an ovary in half, we can see its internal structure is divided into a surface, formed of cuboidal epithelium and connective tissue, a cortex, which contains the ovarian follicles, composed of the egg and its surrounding follicular cells, and a medulla, which is where the aforementioned blood vessels and nerves travel. Next we have the fallopian tubes, sometimes referred to as the oviducts. These 12 cm long tubes have an open end near the ovary, which is used to catch the egg as it's released, and an end which connects directly to the uterine cavity. The fallopian tubes act as a passageway for the egg to reach the uterus from the ovary. Like the ovaries, the fallopian tubes are surrounded by a sheet of peritoneum, this time known as the mesocelpinx. Unlike the ovaries, there are no additional dedicated ligaments holding these tubes in place. At their ovarian end, the fallopian tubes have special, finger-like ciliated projections known as fimbriae, which improve their ability to catch the egg as it's released. The longest of these fimbriae is the fimbria ovarica, which connects directly to the superior pole of the ovary. Continuing proximally, we then have the funnel-shaped infundibulum, the ampulla, the isthmus, and finally the uterine part, which opens into the uterine cavity at the ostium. During reproduction, the egg is usually fertilised within the ampulla of the fallopian tubes. Blood supply to the lateral part of the fallopian tubes is via the ovarian artery, and blood supply to the medial part is via the uterine artery, which itself comes from the internal iliac artery. Similarly, venous drainage is into the ovarian veins laterally and the uterine veins medially, and lymphatic drainage is again mostly into paraaortic nodes. Nervous supply comes via the ovarian and uterine plexuses, and sensation is referred to the T11, T12 and L1 levels. In cross-section, we can see the fallopian tubes have an outer serosa, followed by longitudinal and circular muscle layers, a connective tissue layer, and finally a highly folded ciliated epithelium which lines the lumen. The uterus is a thick, hollow, muscular organ that lies roughly between the bladder inferior anteriorly and the rectum posteriorly. The uterus is most notably the part of the female reproductive system in which the fertilised embryo will implant and grow during pregnancy. Like the ovaries and fallopian tubes, it is surrounded by a sheet of peritoneum in this case known as the mesometrium. When we combine the mesometrium, mesocelpinx and mesovarium, they are collectively known as the broad ligament. The posterior fold of peritoneum between the uterus and the rectum is known as the rectouterine pouch of Douglas, and the anterior fold between the uterus and bladder is known as the vesicouterine pouch. 
You can divide the uterus into the fundus, which is the region where the fallopian tubes join, the body, which encloses the uterine cavity, the uterine isthmus, which is a narrower part in its inferior aspect, and the cervix, which we'll discuss in a bit more detail in a minute. There are a few ligaments that help hold the uterus in place in the pelvic cavity. We've already mentioned the broad ligament, which lies over the uterus and the aforementioned structures, and the proper ovarian ligament, which anchors it to the ovaries laterally. In addition to these, we have the large paired round ligaments of the uterus, which originate from the lateral parts of the uterus, near where the fallopian tubes join the fundus, and travel anteriorly through the inguinal canal to eventually blend with the labia majora. The main purpose of these ligaments seems to be in keeping the uterus in an antiverted position during pregnancy. Blood arrives at the uterus predominantly from the uterine artery, with a small contribution from the ovarian artery. The uterine artery itself originates from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. In the pelvis, the uterine artery passes over the top of the ureter, which is on its way to the bladder. This relationship is often described as water under the bridge where urine, or water, passes under the bridge, or blood vessel. It's important because during a hysterectomy, where the uterine artery is removed, the ureter may also be inadvertently damaged. The uterine artery produces three branches, two of which go to the vagina, and one of which ascends to supply most of the uterus and the proximal part of the fallopian tubes. Blood drains from the uterus into the uterine venous plexus, which passes into the uterine vein and then the internal iliac vein. Lymph drains into a range of nodes, including the paraaortic, superficial inguinal, external and internal iliac. And lastly, sympathetic nervous supply is from the inferior hypogastric plexus, whilst parasympathetic supply comes from the S2, S3 and S4 via the pelvic splanchnic nerves. If we look at the uterus in cross-section, we can see it has three unique tissue layers. Around the outside is a thin epithelial layer continuous with the peritoneum, known as the perimetrium. Then we have the myometrium, which is a thick layer of smooth muscle cells. And lastly, the endometrium, which can be further broken down into a basal and a superficial layer. The superficial layer is the layer that responds to hormonal changes in the blood to thicken throughout the menstrual cycle before being shed, causing menstrual bleeding. It then regenerates again from the basal layer. In this cross-section, we can see that the arteries supplying the uterus have a complex structure. As the vessels enter the myometrium, they first branch and anastomose as arcuate arteries, then radial arteries. Within the endometrium, they produce long basal arteries and deep penetrating spiral arteries which travel towards the most superficial parts of the endometrium. As mentioned, the lowest part of the uterus is known as the cervix. This acts mostly as a gateway between the uterus and the vagina and protects the precious upper genital tract from infection. The cervix has a narrow central canal known as the endocervical canal, with further narrowings at the top and bottom known as the internal and external cervical os respectively. The endocervical canal is lined with columnar epithelium which produces mucus that changes in consistency throughout the menstrual cycle. The outermost part of the cervix is known as the ectocervix. This is lined by non-keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium and projects into the vagina. If we look at the cervix from below, we can see the ectocervix here, with the external cervical os in the middle. There are three pairs of ligaments that support the cervix and hold it in place in the pelvic cavity. Firstly, we have the pubocervical ligaments, which pass anteriorly to attach to the pubic symphysis. Then the cardinal ligaments, which attach to the internal pelvic wall. The cardinal ligaments, like the suspensory ligaments in the ovary, contain the blood supply going to the uterus, with both the uterine artery and vein lying within them. And finally, the paired uterosacral ligaments pass posteriorly to anchor the cervix to the sacrum. The final part of the internal female reproductive system is the vagina. This is the most inferior part of the female reproductive tract and connects the cervix to the vulva or external genitalia. Its main purpose is in facilitating sexual intercourse, but it also acts as a channel during menstruation and childbirth.
Like the uterus, the vagina lies between the bladder anteriorly and the rectum posteriorly. The vagina has thick muscular and elastic walls that are usually opposed closely to one another. The innermost surface of the vagina is lined with stratified squamous epithelium, which is lubricated by mucus produced in the cervix. At the superior part of the vagina is a widening, which can be split into two vaults or fornices, one anterior and one posterior. We can more easily see those in the inferior view of the cervix that we examined earlier. At the lower end is the vaginal orifice, which opens into the vaginal vestibule. Blood supply and drainage of the vagina is via branches of the uterine arteries or veins, as mentioned previously. Lymph drains into the external and internal iliac and superficial inguinal nodes. And parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation comes from the same nerves as the uterus. However, the vagina additionally receives somatic sensory innervation from the deep perineal nerve, which is a branch of the pudendal. Okay, that's a lot of anatomy, but I hope it's been useful. In summary, the internal female reproductive system is composed of five key parts. The ovaries, which produce the eggs. The fallopian tubes, which carry these eggs and facilitate fertilisation. The uterus, in which the fertilised embryo will embed and grow. The cervix, which protects the uterus from the outside world. And the vagina, which facilitates sexual intercourse. I'm planning to cover male reproductive anatomy in a future video. Let me know if there are any other topics you'd like to see me cover soon. Anyway, that's all for now. In the meantime, I hope you learned something and have a great day.